Hello, class. I have lots of important information to share with you this week. The first thing being that there is no new material this week, and there is no quiz and no reading assignment. This is to give you the week to prepare for and then take the midterm. The midterm examination is open book and open notes. Bring all the materials you care to have with you. Knowing the building codes is as much about your ability to look things up as it is about your memory of the rules. The New York City building code will be the reference code for the examination, and this is the code we have been working with so far. Please be ready to go online to the New York City building code during the test if you feel the need to. You can practice that by accessing the website at the link shown here. It may also be that the code sections or tables that you need to see for the answers are provided already in the slides from modules one through six. I do ask that you make it a point to be available for office hours this week. Please double check the scheduled time. This is the last office hours before the examination and it is really a helpful opportunity to ask questions. Here's my advice for taking this examination. The first step, of course, is believing in yourself. I know we are covering a lot of material, but as you have probably figured out already, Codes class is about learning and participation. Please do not be too stressed about the test or panic if you feel you do not know the answer. Just keep at it for the full time allowed. Complete the test and show your work as well as you can. To prepare, please print out the resources that you'd like to use well in advance of the test. Gather your notes and perhaps print the PDF lecture notes or slides that are available for each module on Canvas. The handouts that will be needed for the numerous exam questions on the handout section will be available before the test is. Please take the opportunity to download them, print them, and look them over before the examination starts. Also, if you are not comfortable going online to look up code information from the New York City Building Code during the test, you can print out either the slides from the presentation or key code sections and tables from the online code. The sections and tables from the code that appear in the lecture material are most likely to be the ones you will want to have. Whatever you choose to do, Please prepare your materials before the test starts to save time for work on the actual examination. Here is another important request. Please bring some scratch paper, maybe several sheets of scratch paper. If you use them or if you draw on other materials, please scan or photograph them and send them as a Canvas email attachment. I may be able to give you some partial credit if you send those in. Finally, Please set aside two hours with no distractions and no phones. We are not going to use an online proctoring service for either of the two examinations in this class. It is just not the right fit for this course and the open book nature of the test. There will be exam questions on each of the topics we have covered so far in this class. Specifically, the questions come from the lectures, and I will also test you on your ability to locate things in the building codes. Finally, please note that Project 1 was a really good practice for the test. It involved using a floor plan and some bits of information with your knowledge of the code in order to determine the missing pieces. That last part is the part that I find enjoyable about understanding the codes and using them. I've always found it a lot like being a detective. A lot of this examination is knowing where to find things and then tracking them down. Here is a list of items I'd like to highlight as you prepare for the test. You can definitely use this list to help focus your preparations. There's the difference between prescriptive and performance-based design, the important organizations and documents, which all show up in the lectures, understanding the code and approvals process we analyzed in assignment two of module two, key definitions, please note that the ones I consider most important are pretty easy to find on the lecture slides, 
occupancy classifications and construction type, including the maximum height and area calculation process, active systems and passive systems, compartmentation, meaning fire resistance rated walls and fire doors, special features and components found in buildings. These are all of those extra classifications that are not the construction type nor the occupancy classification. Egress for building organization. Please know the three types of limited travel distances and know how to figure out how many exits are required from a space. Finally, all of the information is in project one is useful. And all the information you worked on in assignment two for module six is important and valuable too. There is no new information in today's lecture. This lecture is all about reviewing for the test. The information that will be on the test questions includes ideas from the homework assignments, so we will look at the best answers from several of those today. If you have diligently completed the weekly assignments, that should help to put you in a position to do well on the test. We have discussed two approaches to building safety for designers to use. Mostly, we have talked about prescriptive compliance, but we have also talked about performance-based design. Unlike complying with the stated code requirements in a prescriptive compliance approach, using performance-based design requires the design team to determine safety goals and objectives, work with the authority having jurisdiction to turn these into design criteria, and then develop a design that achieves these objectives. Notice that in both approaches shown here, the designer and the rest of the team has to follow the approvals process for that jurisdiction, and both of these will include a lot of documentation. The flowchart shown here is an example of how fire engineers and authorities having jurisdiction prefer the performance-based design process to work and this is reasonably standard in the United States. The approvals process comes from the building codes, and we studied that process in one of our homework assignments. Here are the first correct answers from that assignment where we attempted to connect various approvals tasks to their relative locations and to their location in the greater design and construction process. The chart at the bottom shows the entire process of design, construction, and finally occupying the building. The beginning of that process, which is often called the design process, includes a review of the prescriptive requirements. It is always necessary to do the online research about the prescriptive requirements, even if the design team is planning to approach the authority having jurisdiction with a performance-based design. And that means knowing the applicable code and who the authority having jurisdiction is. Both that review and performance-based proposals can and should proceed actually starting to design the space or the building. The term construction documents is both a set of drawings and documents that the design team produce and a step in the process. These documents are likely to be the most important deliverable the interior designer will contribute to creating. Moving on to the next group of tasks, the permit process is when the authority having jurisdiction reviews the design, provides feedback, and finally allows construction to begin. This is after the design is concluded, but before construction starts. The keys to this part of the process are proper documentation, following the authority's instructions, and remembering that the design team is responsible for the safety of the design, not the approving authority. During the construction process, the designer is likely to interact with contractors. Contractors and subcontractors are the people who do the work of making the physical building or renovating the space. They are especially important for design-build active fire safety systems. At the end of the process, both the construction process and the code and approvals process, there is the certificate of occupancy. As I alluded to earlier, many of the important definitions we've covered 
are provided in the lectures and have been shown like this, often with their own special font. You could also look at the glossary of the textbook as part of your test preparation to remind yourself of the new terms you have encountered in this class. During the lectures, we have also identified important organizations and the different codes and standards. These have names and frequently also have abbreviations, and I hope you have picked up on these through repetition. Knowing this kind of shorthand is part of being a design professional. Moving on, something you probably have figured out during this class and during the egress module especially is that lots of requirements are based on the occupancy classifications of spaces. You cannot apply the code requirements effectively if you are not able to determine the occupancy of a space based on its use. Please get comfortable with Chapter 3 of the New York City Building Code and the different letter occupancy classifications used in that and other IBC-based codes. Remember that many of the occupancy classifications also have numbered subclassifications and that these affect the requirements of the code too. Our next topic to review is passive and active safety systems. Each of these had a lecture focused on them and as a result you know that they are important. Compartmentation and fire resistance ratings are a good example of passive systems. On the other hand, active systems include all the electrical and water-related fire safety systems. There are also additional systems such as exit signs and emergency lighting that are provided as part of the means of egress. To me, the number one rule of passive systems is that we use compartmentation to prevent the spread of fire and smoke from floor to floor within a building, as shown on the left-hand side of this image. When we studied passive systems, we learned about the importance of fire resistance rated assemblies for construction type and compartmentation, as well as fire protection rated assemblies to protect openings. By now, everyone should know about important classifications that are identified by the building code, especially high rise buildings and atrium spaces. The codes really emphasize classifying the built environment, and this is especially true in projects related to existing buildings, which we can classify as repair, alteration, or addition. You can learn how to determine if your project includes these classifications and know the precise measurable definitions associated with them. The codes include precise definitions that include specific dimensions. In one of our lectures, we studied how to use egress requirements and we studied the progression of increasing safety and how it's used to organize a building or floor plan. As interior designers, you will often work in tenant fit-outs, existing buildings, and spaces where the main egress strategy is already in place. But that does not make it any less important to understand how egress works. We learned how to calculate occupant load and had opportunities to practice it in both Project 1 and the egress homework assignment. During that practice, I hope you have learned to identify the parts of egress shown on the right-hand side of this image. Another idea we studied while discussing egress was combining compartmentation like exit stairway enclosures with the means of egress strategy. The exit stairway enclosure on the left-hand side of this image is an example of combining compartmentation, meaning passive fire safety, with the means of egress. I hope everyone enjoyed the module about egress. As I've said before, this is one of my favorite things to work on and I hope I can be a useful teacher for you on this subject. Let's look at the egress assignment together. Here is the floor plan and table of room names 
from the proposed design. The first thing I'd like to point out is the tidy separation of gross and net occupant load factors in this floor plan. The hotel component shown in red is a gross residential occupant load of 200 square feet per person. In the assembly area on the left-hand side, a variety of net occupant load factors are applied to the individual spaces. These spaces are shown in blue. Notice how the circulation and core spaces in an area with net occupant load factors do not have a color nor an occupant load. While pre-function areas may contain occupants, these are people on their way in and out of the assembly spaces served by the pre-function space. In most cases, assigning an occupant load to the programmed area only is sufficient. We can use the term non-simultaneous use to describe the way that pre-function spaces, circulation spaces, and restrooms work in areas where net occupant load factors have been applied. The people are either in one space or in the other, and we only want to count them once. An important distinction between net and gross occupant loads is these kinds of spaces. You can see that the measurement in red, where we use a gross occupant load factor, includes all of these spaces on the floor plan. In this assignment, we can take the areas that have been provided and determine the occupant loads for all of the spaces. The nice thing about an occupant load for the hotel component is that it is a predictable type of building, a normal type of space with one specific use, in this case, hotel guest rooms, and we can apply a single gross occupant load factor from the building code. That makes for one quick calculation shown in red for that whole area. The assembly rooms, based on the description of them in the assignment, should all be assigned an occupant load. Generally speaking, that is going to be 15 net square feet per person. The occupant load for the two spaces and their respective occupancy classifications, R1 for the hotel and A3 for the ballrooms, are the starting point for being able to take a critical look at egress in the design of this floor. Remember that occupancy classification informs the key requirements for maximum travel distances and the minimum required number of exits. The first thing that should jump out to us on this floor plan is that there are two exit stairways in the assembly area. And the space has more than 500 occupants, so a third exit from the blue area of the story is needed. For your reference, here are the maximum travel distances associated with these two occupancy groups. Maximum distances for exit access travel distance, common path of travel, and dead-end corridors will need to be checked on this floor plan as part of the assignment. The assignment asked you to identify code compliance problems with the design. Here are the answers for the assignment, and this presents us with a good chance to review some egress concepts from the lecture and the reading. As I previously indicated, a third means of egress is necessary. In the role of interior designer, it would be difficult to add a stairway without input from the architect and the engineer and the building owner. So perhaps we can provide a route to the nearest available stairway on this same level in order to have a third means of egress. Unfortunately, the kitchen is in the way. And because it is more hazardous than adjacent areas, it is not appropriate to have a kitchen as an intervening room in a means of egress. The code specifically does not allow this, and it is not consistent with the progression of increasing safety. However, it might be possible to connect the assembly occupancy portion of the building that requires three exits to the nearby stairway if there was a route that did not pass through the kitchen. 
here is what reconfiguring the floor plan to do that might look like. Hopefully, as you were looking for non-compliant conditions, you found that there are some dead-end corridors in excess of the maximum allowable length. Remember that the dead-end corridor limits the distance a person can travel away from the exit in error when they've taken the wrong turn and are going the wrong way. Maximum allowable length is based on the occupancy classification. Let's zoom in on the residential hotel guest room component of the floor plan for a moment. Here we find some instances of the common path of travel exceeding the maximum allowable length for that dimension. Common path of travel is usually the measurement of travel from an occupied space towards an exit, but this measurement only goes until an occupant is able to choose between two different exit options. Common paths of travel that we need to check out will often happen in the same area of a floor plan as a dead-end corridor, but the two requirements are not really related. Common path of travel is more challenging to correct than a dead-end corridor because it could require reorganizing the floor plan in more meaningful ways. The next non-compliance I'd like to call your attention to are the two spaces in the assembly portion of the floor plan that have an occupant load calculated at more than 75 persons that do not have a second remote means of egress. These two spaces clearly need more doors than have been provided on the floor plan. A similar error is found on the event garden, which is drawn as an exterior terrace. Exterior spaces above the ground level require egress back towards the building and to the stairways in the same way that an interior room would. These exits should probably be located to provide direct access to the building interior through the pre-function space to prevent the complexity of exiting through adjacent rooms. Let's go into some more detail on this. The space on the left requires two means of egress, but one of them is not separated by the minimum distance in comparison to the maximum diagonal of the space. It also doesn't lead towards an exit. As a result, even though two doors are provided out of the room, the two required means of egress are not provided. The last non-compliance that I want to point out was a bit more challenging to find than the others. Note that this assembly space has movable partitions. When partitions are provided, each partition space needs to comply with the egress requirements individually. In this case, two exits are required. If you think about it, this rule makes sense because people cannot go through the partition during an evacuation scenario. Additional egress routes are required by the New York City Building Code because the occupant load in the subdivided portions of the room exceeds 74 persons. This code requirement is actually less restrictive than most codes are because often a second means of egress is required once 50 persons are present. Here is the relevant table from the New York City Building Code. This table tells us what occupant load requires a second means of egress. And look, the requirements are based on occupancy group. To review, the addition of the following egress routes would correct the compliance problems we have found, and most of them look fixable. Remember that the kitchen wall locations also have to change so that circulation and egress do not pass directly through the kitchen. That was quite a lot of ideas in one homework assignment. Please take another moment to consider all of the th things that we have learned in the process of doing this assignment. The main thing I want you to understand is that we calculate the occupant load according to the building code. Specifically, we calculate it according to the factors in the table from chapter 10 of the NYCBC. 
Then, once we know the occupant load, we can use the means of egress requirements to organize the floor plan of the building or space. Now we can move on to our second major assignment, Project 1. This assignment was an opportunity to look at numerous different ideas from the different modules and apply them to a single design situation. This project was more difficult than anything you will find on the examination. The reason for Project 1 is that I wanted to give you an opportunity to work through multiple steps in a compliance process and maybe use the internet or your notes from our lectures to track down some answers and then apply them. You'll remember that for Project 1, we started with this existing above grade story from an office building. There's a lot of elevators here and it is a big heavy concrete structure. The floor plan shows key information and the existing conditions that the design proposes to get rid of. Some of what we see in this plan will be staying the rest will be taken out to make way for new use. This story is level seven of the building and it is being converted into a conference center that can be rented out independently from the other stories around it. The design team working on the project has done a preliminary layout shown here and now we can look at the code issues that inform this floor plan. Notice that there are existing parts of the building that will stay as is, and these are drawn in a lighter color. Meanwhile, the black lines on the floor plan are the new partitions and the new proposed furniture. Take some time to consider the things that don't move when an interior tenant fit out happens. These features and areas are simply out of our scope. Elevators, exit stairway enclosures, and restrooms are difficult and usually expensive to change. So those are not going to be modified most of the time. And this project is no exception. In project one, I asked you to provide as much information as possible in terms of code compliance. A truly complete answer to this would have started off with a recognition that this is no longer a group B office occupancy. Look at all those large seating areas and open spaces that can be used for gathering people. This is an assembly area, a group A occupancy. More specifically, it is a group A3 occupancy. Neither the adjacent floors, which are separate tenant spaces, nor what the project used to be are going to matter. We are classifying this based on its new use. We are also changing the configuration of the space but not adding more floor area. This means the code defines this project as an alteration. The occupancy group has changed, so the alteration is also a change of occupancy. And if you are really absorbing the material in these lectures, then you will be wondering if it is necessary to do a maximum allowable height and area calculation. And it is necessary. The instructions for project one gave you the information you needed to determine this, and it is a pretty standard step in any change of occupancy project, especially on an upper floor. This may not have seemed like the most obvious thing to do, but congratulations if you did catch on. To use a new occupancy group in a building, the construction type, presence of sprinklers, and other features need to allow for that occupancy to be on the floor where it is proposed. If it wouldn't be safe and allowable to put this new proposed group A3 use on such a high floor, remember this is the seventh floor, for a new building, then it would not be permissible to add this use to an existing building. With that in mind, let's take a look at the occupancy and the height and area calculation before we go on to the fun floor plan related parts of project one, which I have listed towards the bottom of this page. The information provided in project one gave the minimum fire resistances achieved by the structural elements of the existing building. Remember, to define the construction type, it is necessary to check that all of the structural elements meet the minimum fire resistance for their respective elements of the construction type, as shown in this table. In this case, the existing building is construction type 2A.
we know our construction type 2A and our occupancy group A3, so now we can use the three tables and our knowledge of NYCBC Chapter 5 to determine the maximum height in feet, the maximum height in stories, and the maximum area per story. We learned about this in Module 5 if you'd like to go back and review. And here is where we have to look at these limitations and compare them to the new occupancy classification. Let's ask ourselves the question, if it isn't permissible to make a new building with this specific occupancy group and construction type beyond a certain height or a certain maximum area, then will the code allow a change of occupancy that creates that same situation? And the answer I hope you are all thinking of is no. This process should feel very familiar to you as we just did it a couple of weeks ago. We go over from the occupancy group and down from the construction type to get a maximum height in feet. In this case, 85 feet. Well, that was easy and fun. And now we just do the same process again with the next table to get the maximum height in number of stories. And in this case, that answer is seven stories. Finally, the last table we need to look at is the table that shows maximum areas. Now you and I both know the allowable area on this table isn't the whole story when it comes to determining the allowable area. But in this case, if the allowable tabular area for the story is already larger than the area of the story of the building we are comparing it to, then we don't really need to keep digging into the process. Our allowable tabular area for a single story of a multi-story type 2A group A3 building is 35,000 square feet. If you have measured the building area of the Project 1 floor plan, you will find that that area is about 17,000 square feet. Just remember that the allowable area per story will increase due the, to the presence of frontage, which we don't really have any information about in this assignment, and that there's also a maximum area for the entire building to consider. If your analysis of project one has made it that far in the height and area process, then I am extremely impressed and you're doing a great job. Now we can bring it all together and compare the maximum allowable values from the code with what is proposed in the description of project one and our measure. It looks pretty good. We are lower than the maximum height in feet. We are lower than the maximum height in stories. And our allowable area for a story is substantially less than the tabular allowable area for a story. The code is telling us that it is acceptable to do this change from group B to group A3 on this story of this building. Moving on from height and area, here is the proposed floor plan with some key area measurements made on it. We will use these measurements to calculate the occupant load for the proposed design. If you did this in less detail when completing the assignment, that is totally fine. After all, the description of the design is an initial proposal rather than a fully developed approach from the design team. What is important is that you as a student already understand that in group A3, we need to use a net occupant load approach. And that occupant load is based on numerous areas. So let's talk about this process on project one now. First, we divide the story up into areas of similar use with special attention to the large rooms so that we can make sure they have enough exit access doors for the occupant load that will be present in. Everyone looks at buildings a bit differently, but these are the areas that I would pick and their measurements. You did not have to get this detailed in the measurement, but good job if you did. And at a minimum, you should be trying to measure every room. The big conference rooms are clearly important spaces. Notice that one of them can be divided into four parts by partitions. So if we wanted to do the occupant load for each of those partitioned areas separately, we could also do that. 
and that would be a sensible step. There is also the big waiting room or breakout or lounge space on the north side of the project, shown as having 3,700 square feet. It would be a good idea to get feedback from the authority having jurisdiction about the occupant load for this one, because this kind of use just doesn't appear in the NYCBC table of occupant load factors. Personally, I see this area as a little bit like pre-function space for the conference center, so I would not be obligated to put a dense assembly type occupant load in this space. But I also see some desks for program that might have people in them who are not the same people inside the conference rooms. The code official or fire marshal may have some input to offer here. Something between 15 square feet per person and 100 square feet per person is probably appropriate. And either approach is correct in your assignment as long as you know why you are deciding to calculate it the way you are. This floor plan also includes a few less densely occupied office use spaces for the staff. See the area just to the east of the conference room next to the number 690? Someone clearly works at that desk and in that office, so it needs to have an occupant load too, but not as dense as an occupant load for an assembly use. This office use is a good example of an accessory occupancy, a term we ran into several modules ago. There are also some even less densely occupied storage and mechanical rooms present on this level. Here are the occupant load factors being applied to the areas as I would have done. Notice how on the right hand side, we get the occupant load one space at a time, and we can total it up at the bottom. Please notice the little wiggly line at the bottom. This is an approximate answer. Any of you might have looked at one of these rooms and seen its use a little different, or measured a little different, but we should all get the big rooms about the same and getting something similar to this total number of persons as our occupant load on the seventh floor with the proposed new use would be a correct answer. And here are the occupant loads in context. We used the red area numbers to calculate the green number of occupant loads. The first is square feet, the second is a number of persons. This type of information is often shown on life safety code compliance diagram in the set of contract documents. Notice that the remaining corridors could either be treated as one person per 100 square foot or as non-simultaneous use space and not loaded as I have shown them here. Again, either is a good answer in your assignment, and in an actual project, it could depend on the preference of the authority having jurisdiction or designer as to how they want to show the occupant load for these spaces. Congratulations on finding the occupant load. Let's move on to the next part of project one, the placement of manual fire alarms and portable fire extinguishers. You can find requirements for these devices in the building code, and in some jurisdictions, the criteria for laying these out will also appear in the fire code. The New York City Building Code references the requirements from NFPA 72, National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code, for information about manual fire alarms. You'll recall that NFPA 72 is what we call a reference standard. Another referenced standard, called NFPA 10, provides the requirements for the placement and installation of portable fire extinguishers. These extinguishers will be mounted on walls and perhaps on columns. Placing these devices is a very common step in the design process, and I wanted you to give it a try on this floor plan. Manual alarms are an active fire safety system, and they are part of the building's fire alarm system. A building may not require these under the current code, but if the owner and fire alarm system designer decides to include them, and they frequently will, then the spacing must meet specific requirements of the building code and the installation must meet NFPA 72. The spacing criteria have been discussed previously in this class. We have to provide our manual alarms within five feet of the exit doors, 
and also be sure that no area is more than 200 feet of travel distance from an alarm. Portable fire extinguishers are required at specific hazards in the building or space, places like kitchens and rooms with hazardous materials or fuel-fired equipment. Extinguishers must be provided so that A, no space is more than 75 feet of travel distance from an extinguisher, and B, an appropriate quantity of extinguishing capability is provided based on the size and hazard classification of the space. The idea of the minimum extinguishing capability present is provided in this table from NFPA 10. A typical extinguisher is going to be sized 4A, and you will see this if you look at the label of the next fire extinguisher you pass in a building corridor. The label on the extinguisher is likely to say 4ABC, which means it is a multi-purpose fire extinguisher and its size based on the volume of extinguishing agent it contains is 4A. This is more detailed than the test will require you to learn, but as part of project one, I wanted you to give it a try. Try to figure out how many extinguishers are needed and try to locate them on the floor plan. Using the table and the knowledge from earlier that our floor plan is 17,000 square feet of light hazard occupancy, we can determine that we need six units of A because each unit covers 3,000 square feet and rounding up 17,000 divided by 3,000 gives us six. The criteria for portable fire extinguisher placement on this floor plan comes from this table, but we will also put some smaller type 2A extinguishers in the kitchen spaces because this is a good idea. These symbols represent the fire alarms. Manual fire alarms can be located near the exit doors that lead into the stairways. They can go on whichever wall is available, but just make sure not to place them behind the door as it opens. As it turns out, no location is more than 200 feet of travel distance away from one of these two locations. So the approach here is pretty simple. Two pull stations is enough for this floor. Proper fire extinguisher placement is going to include the two little kitchenette spaces on the floor plan. Both of these should have an extinguisher since people might set up a toaster or hot plate or some other cooking tool that creates a fire risk. Also, we know that 75 feet of maximum distance to an extinguisher does not go as far as the 200 we used for the manual alarms. So we are going to need to find useful locations for extinguishers on walls that meet this 75 foot limitation. It's good to put extinguishers on highly visible walls, but not on nicely finished walls or in a location where they would impede the use of doors. There are lots of potential right answers for this part of project one. Personally, I came to the conclusion that five extinguishers is a compliant approach. Note that when it comes to area coverage per the little table, if we have this many extinguishers, and each is 4A, except for the little 2A ones in the kitchens, we end up with 16 units of A, and that is certainly enough to cover this area. So it would have been possible for you to get a correct answer onto this floor plan without going into that part of the requirement in detail. All you had to do on this floor plan was consider the maximum distance rule. Note that one of the kitchen extinguishers is inside an enclosed kitchen and cannot be seen from the adjacent corridor. As a result, we would not count this towards the extinguishers that are within 75 feet, since the building occupants can't see these and find them to use them. The final activity in project one was trying to find the fire resistance rated walls, and here they are. Basically, we have three types walls present on this story. Walls related to separating shafts from this area, those will be rated two hours. And there are walls that separate areas of refuge from the story, which are also two hours. And third, we have the walls that separate hazardous incidental uses and major mechanical rooms from the rest of the space, which are one hour. These are all fire barriers, if you want to be precise about the terminology. 
The main idea that this drawing shows is that in a sprinkler assembly occupancy, the corridors do not require a rating, and neither do most of the walls. This is representative of a lot of interior alteration or tenant fit out projects, because often the fire resistance rated walls are the ones that the interior designer does not change. Notice that the walls that have a blue or red overlay to show they are rated are mostly gray walls colored for existing to remain rather than the new walls that are in the black color. Notice that the stairways and elevator hoistways have rated walls around them. Those are one of the most common types of shafts that interconnect stories and they need a fire resistance rating. So hopefully by now you feel comfortable with all the content that appeared in Project 1. Before we say goodbye to Project 1, here is one more look at all the tasks we practiced during this assignment. And I'm very proud of all of you for giving it a try. I'm hoping to catch up with as many of you as possible during our midterm review office hours. Please attend and bring your questions. After you finish this video, please look at your schedule for this week and make time to study and take the midterm examination. It is essential to get the examination handouts printed before you go online to take the exam because a number of questions will be based on them. Good luck with your studies and good luck with the examinations.